but he tells of her culinary expertise. And he says, while I never engage in helping in the kitchen because all I do is get in the way, I sit there and marvel at how she can put things together. So listen very briefly to just this one little section of his story. His wife, Denelin, was whipping up a delicacy for someone's birthday. She assured me that she could talk and bake at the same time, so I sat there and talked while she baked. And then I stopped talking. I watched. I had never witnessed the creation of cuisine like that before. He says, I've applauded Julia Child. Loved how she could just cook and stand and talk and do all of these things at the same time. And here's his wife, Denelin, buzzing around the kitchen like the queen of the hive. She snatches boxes from the shelf, pulls bowls out of the pantry. He says, I've been known to stare at an open refrigerator for days, simply trying to find the mayonnaise or the ketchup. Not her. She grabbed the carton of eggs with one hand, the butter with the other, and never paused to look. She positioned the ingredients and the utensils on the table as a surgeon would his tools. Once everything was in place, she went off. Eggs cracking, yolks dropping, shake this, stir that, pour out the milk, measure the sugar, sift, mix, beat. She was a blur of hands and elbows. Conductor of the kitchen. Cleopatra of cuisine, the Da Vinci of the kitchen. I didn't write this stuff. This is Max's. <laughs> the Lord of the lard, the boss of the bakery. She popped the pan into the oven, turned the knob to 350 degrees, wiped her hands with a towel, turned to me, and said the words I longed to hear. Want to lick the bowl? fell at her feet and called her blessed. Well, maybe not. But I did lick the bowl, the spatula, the beaters. And I wonder if her work in the kitchen is a picture of God's work in us. All the transfers that we go through, all of the layoffs, all of the breakdowns, all of the breakouts, all of the difficulties, all of the opportunities, all the sifted, stirred and popped into the oven of our lives. Heaven knows we felt the heat. We've wondered if God's choice of ingredients will result in anything worth serving. Nelson, De Nelson Mandela couldn't blame, if, if Nelson Mandela wondered, who could blame him? Life in prison was harsh. He was confined to a six-by-six-foot concrete room with one window that overlooked a courtyard. A desk, a mattress, a chair, three blankets, rusted iron, sanitary bucket for washing and shaving. Meals came from corn. Breakfast was porridge. Corn scraped from the cob. Lunch and supper consisted of corn on the cob. Along with his fellow prisoners, he awoke at 5.30, went to work on the gravel until noon, ate lunch, worked until 4, back in his cell at 5, asleep at 8. But in the time off, he read Tolstoy, Steinbeck, the Muir, and his Bible. He honed his capacity to compromise and forgive. After 27 years of confinement, at the age of 72, he was released. Those who knew him well described the pre-prison Mandela as cocky and pugnacious. But the refined Mandela at 72 came out mature. Devoted to rationality, logic, and compromise.
journalists noted his lack of bitterness. Others observed he was unmarred by rancor. And within four years, God used him to be president of South Africa. All persecuted, then fledgling church. He had all of the right background, all of the right credentials, and yet he used those in an evil, vicious way. God had to remind them, the story is not over yet. There's more to come. Watch. Wait. When God locks a door, we hear that he opens a window. All of us have gone through our locked door periods of life. Times when everything seemed to be going well, and then all of a sudden, boom, it just drops off. For really no explainable reason. Everything seems to be going successfully, and then all of a sudden, it stops. I know when I was in Flint, at the start of my ministry, couldn't have been happier. It was the most difficult ministry I've ever had. But we started Love in the Name of Christ. We had a library branch. We had a reading program. We had a jobs training program. We had a summer recreation program. We had all of these ministries that large church marveled at. And then the bottom dropped out. It all stopped. Our classes, our denominational group, decided that our small church of 30 people wasn't worth keeping open. There was nothing redeemable about it. So our $30,000 a year budget took a major hit when they pulled $9,000 worth of funding out of it. And it wasn't as though they gave us a year to deal with it. They told us in October that by December we were done. Unless, of course, we could come up with the extra $9,000. That moment in time, everything seemed to stop. We wondered where we'd go next, or if we'd go anywhere. Whether God was done with us, or whether it was, was just another thing we needed to go through. In the end, we ended up in Lafayette, Indiana, a town we'd never heard of before that there for 10 years. From there, we went to a place called St. Albert, Alberta, and we were there for 12 years. And in each place, the church grew, primarily because we learned some very valuable lessons throughout all of that. God had cracked the eggs, dropped the yolks, stirred this, whipped up this, all of it painful, None of it I would wish on anyone. And none of it would I trade for anything. When God closes that door, as he did with Saul, he opens an even better one, as he did with Paul. He struck Saul blind on the road to Damascus. And raised him up with a new vision. For being theological underpinnings for a new endeavor. In all of that, the lesson is this. God needs you. He's had a plan for you from the beginning of time. Since before you were born, actually since before the creation of the world, God had a plan for your life. And sometimes we wander through life as though we're clueless. Well, God might have a plan for everyone else, but he missed me. I must have been standing behind the door when plans were handed out. Wrong. God had a plan for you. He continues to have a plan for you. And if you're not in the midst of of what you think God is leading you to do, then be patient. For God is at 